Good evening, everyone. I'm so delighted to welcome you all to tonight's very special lecture to hear from Yasmin Larry and learn more about her truly inspiring work as an architect and an entrepreneur. Tonight's lecture was pre-recorded. The reason was the time difference. It's 3 a.m. in Karachi, but also it's Yom Kippur. And I also wanted to note that with an environmental consciousness that is so central to Larry's work, this lecture would have been much more difficult and environmentally harmful had it not been remote. So all these things are coming together in a beautiful way. In many ways, Yasmin Larry's trajectory is one that registers and models in the most urgent and inspiring ways the trajectory that architects and architecture should take today. She is Pakistan's first female architect and among the best known architects of the country. After graduating from the Oxford School of Architecture, now Oxford Brookes University, Larry opened her practice Larry Associates in 1964. She was elected to the Royal Institute of British Architects in 1969 and has built several outstanding landmark buildings in Pakistan, such as the Aban Amro Bank in Karachi. Her work has been widely praised. She's considered one of the pioneers of brutalist architecture and her projects were included in a Faidon Books collection of the best buildings of the 20th century. This early success is what I believe she has referred to in some of her recent interviews as her architect phase. In 1980, her interest slowly turned away from new construction to the question of preservation. Larry co-founded the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan, dedicated to research and the safeguarding of Pakistan's cultural heritage with her husband, the noted historian, Suhail Zahir Larry. Through, their, through her work, several historic monuments in the World Heritage Sites of Makli and Lahore Fort are conserved. In 2016, for example, with support from UNESCO and the Republic of Korea Funds and Trust, Larry led the revitalization of ancient glazed Taz and Sindh project, for which her firm worked to complete the 16th century tomb of Sultan Ibrahim, while imparting ceramic making skills to poor communities, especially women, for income generation. Today, and as a result of the sequence of the earthquakes, floods, and conflicts that have taken hold across Pakistan since, 20, oh, since 2005, affecting especially the most vulnerable people in rural areas, Larry has dedicated her energies, her practice, and extensive knowledge and experience to working with communities to develop adaptive and resilient buildings. She sees her clients, the communities, as partners with whom she can engage in the process of co-creation. A sharp critic of the quote, universal solutions that are all too often offered by aid agencies and the siloed ways in which they work, as well as the urbanization mindset that is imposed on rural communities, Larry insists instead that responses should follow, as she says, forms based on age old wisdom. This has meant rediscovering traditional modes of construction and creatively combining them with contemporary approaches to modularity or to exploring raising techniques so that communities and structures can withstand rising waters, as well as reinventing the ways in which cheap and environmentally low impact materials such as bamboo, mud and lime are combined to produce the most cutting edge, low cost, zero carbon and zero waste structures. Beyond the elegance and intelligence of the work itself, it is the way in which the process itself reinforces its beauty, a confluence that we are all exploring this semester. At the intersection of ethics and aesthetics, it is a process of deep care expressed through sensitivity, wrought architecture and building that brings together the human and the natural, the individual and the collective, so that we can not only imagine but actually experience a different way of being in the world. As Larry noted recently, lamenting that, quote, the elite that will never help the poor, lamenting the elite that will never help the poor, a process of co-creation can be a crucial part of healing the kinds of large scale ruptures that we're experiencing in so many areas. As she said, disasters can be truly devastating and people easily fall into deep depression. But if you give them something to do, it really helps with recovery something people have helped to make is much more valued than something simply given. Please join me in welcoming Yasmin Larry and 
as well as our very own Atea Krankiwala, who will offer a response this evening. I'm so excited to be hearing her speak. Thank you. So hello there, greeting from Pakistan. Thank you so much, Dean Amar Landros, for your invitation, especially as you are known for bringing real world problems to the forefront. And thank you for your lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be able to discuss issues that are closest to my heart with young designers studying at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation that is known as the finest design school in America. I just wish I was able to see you all, but all of us, even at my age, have to learn to live with COVID-19 and its implications. As we know, this is a virus that knows no borders, one that underscores fragility of human life with no assurance of safety due to our wealth or status or how many designer objects we might possess. It reminds us that we all need to assume the guardianship of Earth's resources. I'm optimistic that the realization brought about by the pandemic and the light that so many young people such as yourselves are shining on racism and institutionalized uh, discrimination will lead to the fashioning of a more equitable world. As we know, in the last few months, disparities have risen exponentially around the world. I believe that today Baza or barefoot social architecture that I founded some years ago has greater relevance, especially its tenets that underscore aspects of social and ecological well-being and adoption of sustainable eco-solutions as part of design strategies. As you're probably aware, until 2000, I was a practicing architect and barring a few projects, I had indulged in an extravagant egotistic journey, which focused on serving the elite of my country, which meant that, you know, I use highly energy consumptive materials such as cement, steel, aluminum, reflective glass, and scores of other industrialized materials. You might also know that ever since the highly destructive 7.6 vector scale earthquake hit Pakistan in 2005, post-disaster development has enabled me to utilize on a large scale zero carbon footprint materials consisting of earth, lime, and bamboo. So today I will not be showing you any pictures of my prima donna phase, although for many lectures in the past I did so. I remember when in 2016 I was asked by the RIBA to deliver a public lecture in London which coincided with my Bamboo Women's Center on stilts being shown at 66 Portland Place in the exhibition called Rising from Catastrophe. A distinct honor to be exhibited alongside sketches of a great master such as Christopher Wren of St. Paul's Cathedral. Prior to the lecture, a BBC correspondent called me and asked me about the theme of my presentation. I told him I will be talking about my work in earth and bamboo. The journalist scoffed at me and <laughs> warned me that perhaps I was not aware the audience will consist of many eminent architects and did I think this was the right kind of topic for me to discuss. So for the last several years, it to establish my credibility as a bona fide as architect, <laughs> to skeptical audiences around the world, I showed snippets of my iconic buildings fashioned out of concrete, steel and reflective glass. Well, I have to say that you know, I'm really pleased to tell you that I do not feel the need to do this anymore, as so many in many countries have become familiar with my barefoot theme espousing the case for social and ecological justice for the disadvantaged. Now, famous architecture critic Oliver Wainwright quoted me correctly in his long article in the Guardian newspaper, and he said, I was a star architect for 36 years, now I'm atoning. But this is what I believe this phase of my life is all about. So let me start with my with my slides and let me see if I can handle this presentation. Well, there we are. Uh, just bear with me for a moment. Um, yeah. Okay, we're getting there, I think. So yes, all right. So the theme of my lecture is uh, today is barefoot social architecture for healing the planet. And um, I just thought that maybe I can just talk a little bit about Heritage Foundation of Pakistan. I wanted to show you how my humanitarian architecture has fostered low carbon techniques in heritage conservation, while vernacular traditions of my country have helped me devise strategies for the marginalized. So on the left, you see the amazing 16th century Timuri tomb that was conserved at Makli World Heritage Site by us. And this is the largest Muslim necropolis in the world and you must come and see it sometime. On the right is the reconstructed earth masonry structure that we helped build after countrywide floods of 2010, 
decorated by the rural housewife. So um, my presentation will be in three segments and uh, you can see uh, why barefoot social architecture of Baza, then what is barefoot social architecture? And thirdly, zero carbon approaches and eco-urbanism. Um, I first thought of just doing the first two segments and I thought, you know, maybe it's a good opportunity to talk about uh, urbanism as well because it's impacting our lives so much. So today I would like to share with you my attempts to lower the carbon footprint in structures and to prevent greenhouse gas, the DRG emissions in my various undertakings. Also, there are three strands that you will be able to observe in my work. One is learning from tradition and heritage. Second, uh, community engagement. And third, climate responsive design. Although I've devised these methodologies for marginalized communities living in LDCs or less developed countries, but my hope is that these approaches will be relevant all around the world. For many countries in the global south, in the face of high poverty levels, the democratization of architecture and adoption of participatory approaches have become essential, I believe. But the industrialized world equally needs to be conscious of the cost that has to be paid to sustain prevalent modes of living and building, which as we know are resulting in fast depletion of planet's resources. Now, economist Dr. Howard Frederick reminds us, and I quote, since the industrial revolution in the late 18th and 19th and early 19th centuries, many business entrepreneurs around the world have simply plundered and exploited the environment in ignorance without any thought for sustainability. And this has been really the biggest problem for all of us. On the one hand, now the scenario appears chaotic and unmanageable. On the other, it opens up unfold, untold prospects to create design alternatives for fulfilling the emergent needs of the planet. As a result, I've been able to eke out numerous design opportunities, unclaimed before, in the pursuit of fulfilling the exigencies of social and ecological justice. So first, let's see why barefoot archi social architecture. So I want to provide you with the context which has led me to devise the particular stratagem of Baza. Um, and firstly, I just wanted to share with you that Pakistan is the custodian of rich and diverse heritage, as you see on the left, uh, dating back to the Bronze Age, and it includes tangible, intangible, as well as vernacular heritage. And if you go through the slide, uh, the picture on the left and, and the notes, you will see that we start from Bronze Age and go on to, you know, to Hindus, Buddhists and Gandhara and Sikh monuments and Sultanate period sites, Mughal palaces, and then of course the British colonial period as well. So there's a huge array of, of uh, heritage that we do have. And then there's the intangible heritage of Sufi traditions and spiritualism, folklore, folk traditions, oral history, diverse crafts, and vernacular traditions also, which are very, very strong, which you know are, are really use of, of materials around you and so on. And this is what's really, I think, impacted the way that I work today. And uh, secondly, Pakistan is also among those nations that are struggling to keep up with the SDGs or sustainable development goals uh, because of high poverty levels and low levels of education and healthcare. And then, uh, uh, you know, the climate change has impacted us severely. We are, you know, probably the third highest vulnerable countries with recurring disasters as a, as a result of climate change, as it lies on several fault lines and in the path of immense melting glaciers. And you can see that from 2005, we've just had so many of floods and earthquakes uh, that it's, it's been really impossible to deal with everything. And then I thought I should also share with you uh, with the building industry consumption of materials, what's happening today. So there's something like, I mean, the, 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 the estimates vary, but um, it, you know, I just wanted to show you the da damage to the environment due to, to the use of popular industrialized materials that are used in contemporary construction around the world. The so 40% of world energy, 16% of world's water usage, 3 billion tons of raw material, and you know, huge waste stream. And then also, you know, consumptive materials like steel and Portland cement and ceramic brick even. So we have to be really looking at these particular aspects when we are designing because everything we do all obviously has an impact. And then I also wanted to show you what the international models are that are given out to us. Um, uh, like this is a burnt brick one on the left uh, by uh, an international agency after the floods in, in Sin. And when uh, Magnus, uh, who, was a, who was an advisor to DFID, I think when he calculated for 100,000 one room shelters, he found that you know deforestation would be to the order of 50,770 acres for 10 years. And so burnt brick really should not be used at all. And then um, I also thought I'll share with you uh, that you know the international aid culture, um, I mean, 
during the last 15 years, as I was engaged in providing humanitarian assistance to hundreds of thousands of displaced people, I realized that the present international aid system and the Western charity models are entirely unsustainable and must be discarded. We really should not be following these things because they are not working and they're destroying uh, you know, the environment and, and cultural aspects and, and, and all kinds of things that are really it should not be accepted by countries at all. And then um, this whole issue of social justice and humanistic architecture. A question that I've raised with architects around the world, beginning at RIBA Auditorium in London in 2016, at McGill University in Montreal, at RMIT University in Melbourne, Fukuoka and Tokyo in Japan, twice in, uh, in uh, Tokyo actually, at the Biennale at Oslo and in Vienna, Victoria and Albert Museums in London and Dundee, Battersea Art Center and the Barbican in London, the last one that I did was in March um, uh, you know, of this year, and, and to thousands of live audiences from around the world through over a dozen Zoom lectures and scores of webinars in the past three months. And I asked the young designers present here today, and this is the question, should architects continue to be an instrument in the hands of the 1% who the famous French economist Thomas Piketty says have accumulated the most wealth? Uh, this is a recurring question and I put it to you, put it to everybody because I think we need to really rethink our position uh, in society and the environment that we have today. And then must we inspire only to become prima donnas, creating star architecture for the, for the select few, however much damage it may cause to the earth? And that too in a world where one in eight persons goes to bed hungry every night. As we know, way back in 1987, the Brundtland Commission report had emphasized sustainable development and in particular meeting the needs of the world's poor. While Paul Hawkins' seminal book a decade later in 1999 had warned us about how the excessive use of resources is threatening the earth's future uses. Today, all of us are confronted with enormous disparities within our societies yours and mine. The impact of global warming, climate emergencies and recurring disasters, climate change migrants and conflict impelled camps for the displaced and now the debilitating impact of COVID-19. So I ask you today, can architects play a role in mending the imbalances that we see around us and stitching this highly damaged earth tapestry? So I come to now to my second uh, segment, which is uh, what is barefoot social architecture? So uh, last year, uh, when I was delivering my keynote during the Vienna Biennale on the theme of the broken planet and the use of my barefoot model as a me mechanism for healing the planet, I found that many in the audience were perplexed and asked, why barefoot? And I had to respond, it is because the work I do today is with people who walk barefoot. They have no shoes. I had overlooked that in African countries, nobody is used to people walking without shoes. And uh, so of course, in my country, a vast number are barefoot because of lack of resources, but walking barefoot also has its recompenses. It helps you to tread lightly on the planet and use earth's resources judiciously. Sometimes it's a good idea to just walk barefoot on the sand or on the grass. It was the interaction with poverty stricken vulnerable populations that forced me to dispense with my highly inflated ego, I, like every other architect, was insufferable, oblig obligating me to swallow the bitter pill of humility by sitting at the threshold of the poor, exploring their age-old practices. Learning from Pakistan's pre-industrial vernacular heritage, I understood that design is not a standalone activity. It must be in underpinned by considerations of social Im impact and ecological sustainability. I also understood that there are greater deficit, where there are greater deficits, you need more design, not less. And it is only good designers that can fulfill that void. And that's where I miss architects working in the humanitarian field. There don't seem to be enough of them there. Today, my life's mission is to find ways to build for the other 99% of our populations, as well as to deal with climate change impact by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the dictum I follow is, low cost, zero carbon footprint, zero, failure, zero waste. Everything that I'm designing, whatever I design, this is uppermost in my mind as to how we are actually dealing with the, with the design issue. So uh, now I just, I'm sharing this slide with just to show that between 2011 and 2018, we were able to actually serve something like 0.84 million people uh, by providing them with uh, shelter and water and uh, 
forests and uh, sanitation, etc. And that is something like almost a hundred thousand per year. And this can have this can be done if the costs are low and we make everything affordable for people and, the, and, and we can design well. So uh, um, now to define Baza, uh, barefoot social architecture is akin to social engineering for bringing about social change, incorporating environmental, cultural, and technical dimensions, resulting in transformation of mindset among from a cycle of dependency to a culture of pride and self-reliance. On the one hand, Baza seeks to democratize architecture that provides people with well-being and self-esteem. On the other, it has partiality for zero carbon footprint using ubiquitous earth, conservatives, magic lime, and renewable bamboo. As you might know, these are the only three materials that I use in my work today. So uh, there are four tenets to, uh, uh, to Baza. And uh, the first is maximizing the potential of barefoot ecosystem. Secondly, zero carbon humanistic architecture fostering pride, dignity, and well being. Thirdly, delivery of unmet needs by barefoot incubator for social good and environmental sustainability called the BISCIS. And then, fourthly, adoption of non engineered structures for shrinking the ecological footprint. Now, so this is uh, tenant one. And uh, you can see from this uh, graphics that um, this is a barefoot ecosystem that consists of barefoot economy, uh, barefoot market, barefoot enterprises, barefoot entrepreneurs, barefoot skills, and barefoot products. And these are all there, but they're all overlooked because people don't think that the poor can do anything. But you know, we really have to now put more faith in people and know that they have the capabilities if only we were there to help them out. So we know that the prevalent, uh, the uh, highly consumptive market economy and market intensive societies pursuing material gains have in any case not benefited the underprivileged. I mean, they, we just haven't got there to them. Uh, since as Carnegie Mellon Professor Irwin points out that uh, they are only, as I, and I quote, motivated by the desire for profit and economic growth rather than human fulfillment. And maybe we have to start seeing how we can, you know, have a win-win situation where we might be able to do both. The Chilean economist Max Neef proposes that for barefoot economy to flourish, and I quote, it is the realization of needs as objective that becomes a motor of development, which leads to the fulfillment of local desires and wishes. Thus, in contrast to the market economy, a barefoot economy promotes human-centered development, itself being regenerated by low-cost products that weave nature with age-old vernacular techniques, contributing to a more equitable lifestyle. And you can see here how we can we maximize the barefoot ecosystem if we understand that all these aspects are there for us to be able to uh, capitalize on. So now, believe it or not, all these do feed into a massive barefoot ecosystem. I mean, the poor, uh, you know, outnumber the wealthy in many countries, especially mine as well. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this particular aspect has been overlooked by economists and politicians alike. It has the potential to function by itself as a parallel economy distinct from market economy through an enabling process of serving and sharing with the other disadvantaged populace. So whatever everybody does, if that can be shared by the other poor people, then you really have a situation where people start having a much better quality of life. So working with marginalized communities in the last years has allowed me to adopt a bottoms up approach, encouraging different uses of funds and resources, efficient use of funds and resources, rights based development, knowledge sharing through training and guidance for cost effective output. So uh, now we come to the tenet two, which is zero carbon humanistic architecture, fostering pride, dignity and well being. Uh, in my work, I follow two gurus. One is the Lime Guru, Marcus Vitruvius, was BC Roman architect that you must all know about and his book, uh, The Architectura, or 10 Books of Architecture. And of course, The Earth Guru, which is Hassan Fatehi, the 20th century Egyptian architect and author of Architecture for the Poor. So let's look at um, uh, Lime Guru Marcus Vitruvius. So today I'm bound by his four elements of air, water, earth, and fire as limits of architecture. In his extensive treatise, he defines all bodies as being com composed of four elements, and I quote, those with larger portion of air are soft, of water are tough from the moisture, of earth hard, and of fire more brittle. Thus, the alchemy of natural elements addresses the bounds of sustainability spanning the spheres of economic, social, moral, and cultural aspects. I believe that the use of these elements leads us to the confines of democratic norms and behavior. And then, of course, the second one, uh, the great um, 
uh, Guru Hasan Fatihi. Uh, and as Hasan Bey would have it, I'm also conscious of all, at all times of the obligation to be close to nature and to the people and to traverse a path which would unleash the creativity of the common folk uh, using their intangible reserves of ancient wisdom immersed as they are in their folklore, oral histories and craft traditions, the so-called vernacular expression. You can see that um, Hassan Fatih was talking about the poor almost a century ago when nobody had ever thought of them. And that's really something fantastic. So, and then, uh, uh, well, I, I'm sort of advocate of zero carbon, as you know. And um, so as far as my work is concerned, I consider myself an advocate of earth, lime and bamboo, as I said earlier, as among the most sustainable materials, which are the only materials I use in my work today. As you might be aware, clay does not have to be burnt in fire to gain strength. You do not have to fire it. Uh, the co combination of earth, water, and sunlight provides a building material of great value. The ever-present earth is most freely available and one that is most used around the world by the poor, very little by architects. The second material is lime. It is hewn as a rock, which the alchemy of fire transforms into an unparalleled force that has provided strength to the Roman aqueducts and the impregnable 16th century Mughal forts. Once common earth and lime are mixed together, water provides a strength that can be not be surpassed by any other material and the least by Portland cement. I mean, a lot of people who work in preservation and so many of you must be working in heritage conservation must know the value of lime. And why is it that it's being discarded? This is something that we have to think about and how contemporary architects should start now replacing cement with, with lime. So lime also absorbs carbon from the air through what is known as the lime cycle, comprising sequence of change in the form from burning, uh, slaking and hardening and returning to the original carbonate form. The third material is bamboo, which is among the most important elements for climate change mitigation and adaptation as it stores carbon. Nurtured by soil and water, it has incomparable characteristics. It provides a crop every two to three years and is among the largest renewable resources. The quality of its resilience is extraordinary and it has become the mainstay of all my work that I do. I mean, I, there's nothing that I build which does not have bamboo in it. In fact, all the three materials actually. So um, now when I was uh, giving a public lecture in Tokyo a few years ago on the occasion of receiving the highly prized Japanese Fukuoka Award for Arts and Culture, a member of the audience questioned me asking how long did I think bamboo would last? My answer was in Pakistan, I thought perhaps 25 years, but ever since I visited the beautiful Kumamoto castle after the earthquake in Japan, it can last for 400 years. I saw that beautiful bamboo inside the structure when the, pl when the plaster had come off. So this is how bamboo can work. Some examples of humanistic architecture as a result of co-building and co-creation I'd like to present to you. So this is like, uh, again, earth walls and, and bamboo roofs. And you can see this is co-building for, for really for pride and the way the women are decorating them. And then these are some others also again, the bamboo basic you know, frame and then uh, earth plaster, earth and lime plaster. This is for identity and dignity. And on the right, you see an echo toilet. That's, where, that's, that's what we are trying to build uh, in large numbers in, in Pakistan. And then uh, this is the World Habitat winner, Urdan Pakistan Chula Stove. Uh, now, you see these decorated housing stoves have been achieved due to a large-scale participation of women. 60,000 of the Urdan Pakistan Chula have been built and have contributed, and women have contributed fully to the construction of over 40,000 zero-carbon one-room houses. And you can see how they use their creative skills uh, themselves and have, how they, you know, beautiful they make everything. That's why I believe in co-building and co-creation. So, uh, sorry, just going back, incidentally, one team of barefoot entrepreneurs who helped build 30,000 of the stoves has earned 40,000 US dollars over four years or 10,000 per year when the original income was only $400 a year. So that's where the potential of the uh, barefoot market is. If you have trained people who can go around, they can make a huge amount of money. I'm hoping many of them will become millionaires very soon. So, okay. So today I'm no longer interested in being recognized as the author of my works, the barefoot social architecture that I practice creates a blank canvas but relies on the participatory process, which facilitates ordinary people to utilize their creativity, particularly women, bringing to life unique artworks. 
and and sorry going back to that again as you can see how, how could i call it my creation when each woman has endowed it with attributes that take the work beyond architecture and in the realm of public art and this is what's really an eye opener had been for me as well when i started to work how everybody participated and how you know their own creative energy came to fore all right so now we go to baza tenet 3 which is delivery of unmet needs uh, through barefoot incubator for social good and environmental sustainability um now this is called biscas which helps to train monitor and mentor the poorest communities to fabricate products for the other poor in order to fulfill their un unmet needs so the biscas trainings have helped to attain rights based development consisting of one safe room house a shared eco toilet shared water supply and pakistan chula for clean food for a very small amount of money and uh, this is something that and a model that i'm hoping that we can really spread uh, all over pakistan if not elsewhere also and then uh, this is again um, uh, the other unmet needs of of the poor it shows production of affordable items being produced in specialized villages to cater to the unmet needs of the other poor these are all marketed around uh, you know the villages where they are being produced we do not target the rich for these products at all so last year 230 former beggars drawn from eight villages were trained in green skills and crafts for livelihoods each village specializes in affordable good quality products consisting of green construction materials such as earth lime bamboo and thatch organic soap organic compost and natural fuel briquettes that they that they use for the pakistan chula stoves the earth stoves and then climate smart farming for food security craft products for everyday use for achieving a better quality of life and in the project 70% rose above the poverty line within about 14 months as you are, as uh, you see there is a whole range of products that are needed for the poor to survive as long as they are available at affordable prices and uh, this is i just wanted to show this training center it's called the zero carbon cultural center or zc3 and the incubated trainings are carried out in this huge bamboo marquee structure 57 feet wide 80 feet long and 27 feet high it's all bamboo there's just no other material in this and this is served very well indeed and then uh, there's some more slides just to show you the interior of it and where you enter it and then uh, again uh, these are the trainings that are going on and as you can see they are mostly women they are men too but we really focus on women a lot and then uh, there is another slide which shows the products that they are making which is to do with the uh, kashi or the or or uh, glazed uh, ceramics uh, and they also do very good uh, terracotta work as well uh, and then i just wanted to show you that the same marquee then doubles up at, as an international uh, a conference center as we did uh, last year as, as an interbar international conference was held uh, in last november in the place and these are the the uh, logs or the lodges that we built for our uh, for our delegates uh, who had come uh, the international delegates who arrived there and and stayed uh, at makli for the conference and then um, so you can see that uh, this is something that is working and we are getting really good results so my Barefoot social architecture actually is is uh, giving us good dividends. Now we come to the last tenet, which is about the tenet four, which is to about non-engineered structures for shrinking the ecological footprint. You see, most engineers are not willing to look at these things because they think they cannot calculate. So oh, this is the big problem, and we have to really now convince the engineering community that we need people who can work with these materials and tell us that yes, they will be safe. But then of course there are other methods like like. Um, um, you know using a, a shaking table test which i will show you how we did for, on one of them and uh, so um uh, this uh, non engineered structure this is uh, this one have placed pakistan in the lead as the largest zero carbon shelter program in the world as you see uh, no carbon emissions no trees were felled 1750 villages uh, were served and 300000 persons were housed and again the materials are only locally sourced clay low energy lime and renewable bamboo um and then i just thought i'll show you this because uh, this actually was done by al jazeera and this shows is a double story bamboo structure on stilts it was done actually 2011 so it's been there for about you know, 9 years now and every year uh, uh, the flood waters come in because it's just by the river and uh, uh, and it's it saved us very well uh, and you can see everybody was safe the people are safe in it and all the belongings are also stored in it when the when the waters come so um and then um i thought i'll show you this one because this is really a prefabricated uh, you, uh it's it is based all on prefabricated panels which are only about 5 feet by about 8 feet 
And uh, I just thought I'd show you how it can be assembled very quickly and um, can be of different configurations. So this is the first one, which is gives you a 12 foot by 12 foot room, like the lodges that you show that you saw for the delegates. And uh, it can be put up, you know, as I said, less than in a day. If you add two more panels, you can make it into about 18 foot by 12 foot and becomes a classroom in a village. Uh, and again, if you add on two more, then it becomes uh, what we now call the, the Interbau Center. It's about 18 foot by 18 foot room. Uh, so um, so it, it's modular, so you can keep on adding on and uh, it's very easy to construct. And because of Makli, we've learned how to make domes uh, in bamboo, which we did not before. And so there's always, you know, you keep on learning more and more about the material as you explore more. And that is the beauty of this kind of work. And uh, this, I just wanted to show you the 12 foot rooms, how they can be you know, put together in the form of a beehive and they become lodges for people to come and stay. Or for instance, uh, this becomes the uh, Interbau Center uh, when you add on more panels. This is the Interbau Training and Resource Center built using prefabricated bamboo panels. It is dedicated to His Royal Highness Prince Charles in acknowledgement of his support to our work as he himself is a great proponent of zero carbon structures. And so that's very good to have his support because he does talk about this also. And I want champions for zero carbon. So now this is actually a, a entirely a, a, a structure which is which is proved to be earthquake proof. And I'll show you how, but I just thought very quickly if we can run through it to see how um, uh, lime concrete in the foundation and then uh, basically uh, sun-dried bricks and then we build in at every every so often these bamboo lattices so that whole structure can get tied together and uh, and we also use uh, bamboo reinforced uh, uh, lime concrete for the ring beam as you can see that this is bamboo and then the ring beam and then you put lattices on the two sides also so you tie the whole thing together and and you get a structure that's literally uh, survives any kind of an earthquake and I'll show you how in the next one. So this is really the protocol of the for the shaking table test, which was it was done at the NED University, 50% of the scale model, and we started off with 25% and go on to 100% of Kobe earthquake uh, at the simulations of the movements, and then 125% to 275%, and nothing happened to it. And then they said, you know, the vice chancellor was there, and he said we've got to break it. So they went on to 670%, and I'll show you how this happened, because uh, I, I want to I feel like I'm a I am, you know, really constantly promoting and, and uh, marketing bamboo. Uh, so this is really as if it was the Kobe earthquake, which is up to 100%. And then now we, we are now on 275, 175% more than Kobe earthquake. And you can see that you know, we are testing all the time to show you what's happening. And nothing happened, right? And now they say, well, let's try to see how we can break it. They really had to stop because the reinforced concrete structures around them were it felt that were going to be affected. So um, you see, it, it survived. It survived the uh, all these uh, so many of these uh, jolts, earthquake jolts, and uh, uh, it didn't collapse. So there's life safety assured with this kind of structure. All right, so I just thought that while I was talking about my world, maybe in your world, there were some principles I came across uh, by one click uh, LCA. I thought I'll, I'll just show them to you that these are also um, the good pieces of advice. And this might help in thinking about lowering the carbon footprint. It might be useful to consider them when you carry out your next design assignment. You know, you might be looking at things and saying, well, how is it that we can just lower the carbon footprint? I know that you cannot get to zero carbon, but at least you will be able to lower it. And I think that's how we need to start. So you can see from you know the time factor, foundation, structure, materials, shape, slabs, parking, uh, you have to really minimize parking everywhere. I think you should really try to minimize vehicles everywhere. And your walls and layers and windows and so on. So there's good advice there if you'd like to maybe go through and see how you can use it. All right, so now we come to part three of my presentation. Uh, which is zero carbon approaches to eco urbanism. Now, in my view, New York with its highest infection rate and its high carbon, high density glittering skyscrapers will no longer be the urbanist future beacon. I maybe you might not agree with me, but this is what I feel after I've seen the results of, of COVID-19, it, how it's impacted New York. 
And as we get accustomed to carrying our business remotely, I'm optimistic that eco-urbanism will take root, drawing upon age-old wisdom and traditional environments found in countries such as Pakistan, aiming for low-rise, medium-density formations uh, with open-to-sky terraces for families to remain in contact with nature when a pandemic strikes, with pedestrian enclaves and local round-the-corner shopping without being dis disrupted by vehicular traffic. And I just thought I'll show you this particular uh, model of Lahore, of uh, the old walled city of Lahore, and a view, uh, an artist view of how the streets uh, have been. And, and you can see that um, this is really what, what we call, can call traditional sustainable urbanism with organic morphology, pedestrian streets, low rise, medium density development, mixed 24 hour cycle, zero low energy natural cooling, passive solar design, courtyard planning, subterranean chambers, water mass, water mass cooling, and semi-public spaces. These are all attributes of such a city. And then I thought I'll just present to you some of the examples of what's, what have we found in Pakistan, uh, which is, you know, uh, several lessons that we could uh, really derive from the past of zero energy natural devices, which can provide comfortable microclimate within buildings without mechanical means. That's, that's uh, bring, bringing about additional benefits in search for eco-urbanists strategies. So this is uh, the, the one on the left is really the wind catches of Tata. These are uh, zero energy wind cooling devices uh, by unidirectional wind catcher, where incoming breeze provides, provides thermal control, air movement, as well as warm air exhaust. And on the right, you see a courtyard, zero energy thermal comfort uh, by utilizing passive solar design and thermal mass in this house in Peshawar. The courtyard helps store cool air during the night, keeping the intern the interior is cool for much of the day. So there are these traditional ways of doing things which may well be quite useful even today. And then on the left, um, I wanted to show you zero energy water cooling devices. And this is the Shalamar garden, which is the wonderful kind of world heritage site of um, by the Mughals, by Shah Jahan. And uh, you can see that, you know, there's the Chahar Bagh uh, or the paradisal garden and uh, spectacular water displays creating a cool environment entirely by natural means. And then on the right is our uh, the, the Lahore Fort World Heritage again, where the pond actually uh, you know, creates the same kind of environment. So there are these uh, devices that we could be looking at. So we should be aware that being responsible for 65 to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions, our urban centers will remain global warming battlegrounds unless urban professionals devise ways to convert them into eco cities. We have seen that traditional urbanism is a result of local wisdom, use of sustainable materials and techniques for minimizing the use of energy. Many of us believe that traditional urbanism equals eco-urbanism, and there is an urgent need to transform our present wasteful urban centers into low carbon eco enclaves. So what does it mean? And you can see this, compact cities, not urban sprawls, low rise, medium density, mixed use development, not skyscrapers, vehicle free walkable enclaves, uh, greenery and water bodies for transforming urban microclimate, low impact architecture, minimum energy consumptive me uh, means prevent demolition of historic buildings. There's no need to keep on rebuilding because that also requires a lot of energy. So uh, we'd have to avoid new constructions and then follow Oslo model for greenhouse gas at 2.51 uh, per capita. Uh, so um, these are the uh, some of the examples that I wanted to bring to you. And this last slide just says loss, low cost, zero carbon, zero waste for saving the planet and the destitute around the world. So I'll just uh, now have just a few more uh, uh, sentences to say um, uh, and just to, to wrap up. So unlike the past, I don't believe architects need to seek the patronage of the Medici's of Florence, the merchant princes of industrial revolution or East India Company's robber barons nor today's powerful multinationals. But there is huge potential for sustainable design solutions in areas with rising disparities, climate change displacements, conflict-driven migrant camps, or just underserved neighborhoods in most countries. Together, we must endeavor to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as we fashion a new urban environment. Based on more sustainable lifestyles, adopting movements such as transition design, degrowth, or low-carbon compact cities which are becoming popular in the West and my own barefoot social architecture for sustenance of the disadvantaged in the third world. 
What if our urban centers are transformed into eco cities embodying the virtues of carbon neutral environment, nature conservation and biodiversity enhancement and conversion of existing vehicular roadways into landscaped forested walking streets for lowering pollution levels, interventions that lead to better health and well being of humankind, because make no mistake, human and planetary health will now take center stage. I believe it is a time for all of us to use our design skills for creating zero or low carbon structures. The ones that I built are, are small scale to cater to the needs of those at BOP, bottom of the pyramid. But these could equally be quite spectacular when innovative architects design for the 1% who have accumulated the most wealth. The zero carbon campus that I have set up provides training in zero carbon, green construction and craft skills. But taking the cue from COVID-19 as remote learning becomes popular, we are developing a series of digital tutorials for step-by-step -step guidance, which will allow vast number of the marginalized and even the wealthy to learn to build uh, do-it-yourself safe zero carbon structures. I would like to welcome you all to our, to our zero carbon campus in Makli sometime. But if the pandemic does not permit it, it is my hope that universities will set up zero carbon workshops within campuses to enable students to become familiar with sustainable materials such as earth, lime and bamboo. I'm concluding with the hope that you will all help me in this mission by becoming zero carbon champions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Atia. Hi, Yasmin. Uh, thank Hello you there. so much. That was uh, wonderful. It was wonderful to listen to, um, to listen to you know you present this sort of long uh, career of yours and the various transformations in it. I think it's fascinating because you've had two careers in one life, you know. And uh, it, 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 both are really long. Like I, I think I was. Uh, you began the Heritage Foundation, I think, in 1980, which is which means that this second career has been, in a sense, even longer than that first one. And um, I think one of the things that this means it, when you have this uh, career spanning uh, almost now, uh, you know, 50 years. Is that one? Is that you? You sort of have you become a witness to history, and I'm fascinated by that. I'm. I think it, in a way, it also reminds me of the fact that you know you are married to a historian, uh, and I'm sure that that in a way has shaped your approach to both history and your experience of history itself. Uh, so you know, beginning with that, I want to kind of ask you questions about how this, um, how you have in a way over time slowly developed what seems, what I would call is some sort of a critique of capitalism. Because when you say this, uh, when, when you uh, propose this idea of barefoot architecture, a barefoot economy, a barefoot um, uh, ecology, I think you called it, um, what you mention is that your, the word barefoot is a critique of consumption that we are consuming too much and how do we um how do we undo our only experience of the world as an experience of consumption and in a sense that's how i understood your uh, use of the word barefoot so i was also thinking about the shoe as a status symbol you know i was thinking about all of the nationalist tropes of runners representing the state wearing shoes um and poor uh, runners not having shoes to wear and therefore you know the the kind of government has to provide shoes so that they can perform on the international stage in an equal way and so the shoe is a very um complex fetishized commodity it's not a straightforward one so i i can completely understand your um barefoot concept as both a critique of consumption and also in a sense a critique of the state that demands a certain kind of um, conformity so that it can present itself. Uh, at the, uh, and so I want to begin by asking you this question. I have, I have a bunch of questions and I'll get to them. And I think I have some uh, ideas of um, how I can ask questions that maybe that are not just my questions, but also questions on behalf of um, other uh, listeners of this talk. But yeah, my first question is, how did you over time develop, use history, use, a, uh, use history and use um, this 
ar arc of your career in which you witnessed history to develop a critique of capitalism? Well, it's in very interesting, Atiya, because you know you're a historian yourself, so you've come up with lots of sort of you know in-depth things that you've kind of noticed, which a lot of people overlook. And so that that's really, really you know very nice also to hear. Uh, well, you see, the thing is that all of us, uh, and most of us, you know, who, who are who are educated and really are very privileged, and I don't think we've ever looked at others who have really had nothing. And I, in my life, uh, experienced all kinds of phases in my life, uh, uh, you know. And because of the earthquake, I think uh, that is really what was the critical moment where I think uh, it it really changed my perceptions about you know who we are, what we are, and what even the country is like. And uh, I understood then that, you know, we've been living in a cocoon, most of us, you know, who, are, who consider themselves to be educated and, you know, we thought we knew everything, but we really don't. And uh, I think it's always, it's very sobering, actually, when you go around um, these poor localities, poor people who think have nothing, but they have this wealth of wisdom that you never had, you never had known about it. And I think that's it really is, is, is as I said, I, I've, I've lost, you know, I, I mean, I was quite insufferable and I lost my ego, basically. I now know I'm, there's a lot of humility in the way that I approach things and I go there and, and learn from them. And there is much to learn. Uh, and, and, and really, um, I think all of us have been part of this very highly consumptive society. We all have thrived on that and we thought that is the best way to do it. And then suddenly, you know, when especially things, you know, when you have disasters or COVID-19 appears, well, all this does not matter anymore. And I think that is really something that all of us have to understand. But also that, you know, what I say is that we have only have one planet, really, there's only one Earth we have. And we all have to be mindful how we treat it. And this realization also has come much later to, to me even, you know, because I was working in disasters, I had no idea. And then suddenly I saw things being built which were actually adding to the whole problem. Because, you know, if you are cutting trees and doing uh, emergency housing, well, what are you doing? I mean, this is international agencies who are doing this because there was no understanding. Uh, and, and so I think uh, I, this is what I want. This is my mission now is to make people understand that we have, all of us have to take care of each other. It is there's no such thing as, you know, you're kind of living in an ivory tower. You cannot anymore. Yeah. So, uh, so hopefully if that comes in and there's more humanism. I think we'll have a better world. Thank you. I uh, want to sort of, the, the, one of my favorite projects of yours is the Tula. You know, it's a beautiful object. But I think that when I when I when I saw your chula, I think what's the your central innovation in the chula was that instead of thinking of it as an object, because the chula has a very long history in the house in the village, right? And it's actually we we know now from studies of the air quality is that it produces horrific amounts of pollution that women are uh, breathing in as they cook, and so it seems to me that this major innovation you made in the Tula is instead of thinking of it as an object, as an industrial design you know, product, as something um, that you can acquire, you thought of it as architecture. You know, the, the, what, what struck me is that your Tula is so architectural. It's, um, it, it, it's a structure and you call it a pedestal, you call it a throne, you call it something that you know, elevates the um, work of women. And I, I'm, what I'm also fascinated by, of course, in all of this is your design process. And so it would be wonderful to hear about how you um, interacted with the women who use this object to design this architectural, to turn it into an architectural thing that then could be both designed and ornamented, decorated, you know, become a real point of celebration instead of a point of pollution and, you know, destroying destruction of the body. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you like it because I think, you know, I think this is probably the best thing that I could have ever done. I mean, I, when I look at it and, you know, I look at Finance and Trade Center, which is at 750,000 square feet of area and 2,000 people are there every day and so on. And uh, it's a huge, uh, huge structure. And then I look at the Chula, which is just tiny and little and really, but the impact that's had is far greater than Finance and Trade Center could ever have. So that's where the beauty of all this actually is. And also that it evolved actually, because there was, a, we have a partner actually who designed the scientific part, which is, uh, they're called Park Swiss Technologies. And uh, he designed it some years ago and we discussed, we wanted to promote it. You know, there's a lot of discussion on the stove because as you rightly say, there's so much of, you know, the ill health and eye problems and 
chest issues and so on. And then also uh, because of the fire, the open fire, uh, children get burned, women get burned and so on with their saris or dupattas and everything. So uh, it, it, the stove is very important for women, not so much for men, but for women, it's absolutely the most you know, important thing in life. So uh, I wanted to do something and then uh, this partner who uh, helps us a lot and they came up with this idea, but they had something which was done with brick and it would be on the floor, on the ground and so on. And because I've been working in flood areas uh, and you know, Mohenjo-daro, I mean, that's where everything comes actually from the past. Mohenjo-daro is built on these platforms. And I said, well, why not platforms for everything? Because that's how you save people and their life, their you know, belongings and everything. So we had to have a platform. And uh, I, I was hoping that women will stand and cook at that. So the platform was small and we had the chula on it and uh, they started, but then I found, no, they wanted to sit. And so the platform became bigger and bigger. And then I found that they, I mean, we designed something like I said, well, a small one, six foot by six foot would be okay. But lo and behold, they were 10 feet or 12 feet long and getting wider and wider because women started to use it for all kinds of things for doing their work. They would sit there and, and children would gather around and uh, stories were being told. And suddenly it became a socializing place. So it yeah. suddenly, you know, it, it, it just somehow took on so many more aspects than I had ever thought. And then dignity for women, that was the most important thing that happened. Because see, if you are doing something, you you make a structure, but that can just serve a particular purpose. But here, there's the intangibles that came into force. So the woman, once she's sitting on this throne, the earthen throne, suddenly her, her respect for her, you know, it, it suddenly goes up among men in, in society, in our societies particularly. Yeah. So it's just incredible what that's happened. I mean, the women are much bolder. They stand, they sit erect. If you look at them sitting on the floor and cooking, crouching and cooking and then they're sitting on this particular and each one is sitting absolutely erect with backs erect and that shows that you know they've suddenly found the confidence there's a lot of things that have happened with the chula yeah i'm very pleased about it yeah it's it's an amazing <laughs> it's good yeah yes thank you about that. Uh, you know the other the, so two of the chula that is the kitchen the rasoi ghar in uh the live in, in within this sort of ro, ro, space of the um, the home, the, the hearth is a very important uh, piece of technology. But the other really important piece of technology, of course, is the toilet. And that's another thing you've worked on. This is another space in which women are very vulnerable and in which uh, it, it requires a real consideration of the dignity of the body. Um, so I was also very interested in the kind of technological innovation you've done in produce in, in making sure that toilets can be something that people can achieve. And so I was watching your uh, video of how the toilet is put together. And I was struck by one layer, just one sim simple layer of plastic, you know, for the roof. And I thought that that was very interesting because plastic is an extremely important commodity. It affords us so much uh, value. I mean, we abuse it right as a as a world we abuse plastic in terms of how we use it as a single use product use and throw use and throw but on the other hand plastic has made um the lives of poor the poor uh just bearable in a way you know by providing waterproofing by providing containers by providing so many things and it made me think about how your practice has really brought together many different strands of thinking it's not, it, you know, of course you have a theory of the past and how to retrieve knowledge and information from the past, but it's not like you are rejecting modernity or the future. And so I wanted to ask you about how you brought these different aspects together in your work. Yeah, interesting uh, question actually, and I've not really thought about it much, but uh, uh, looking at it, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, because I practice as a, uh, as an architect for so many years, so I do have knowledge about you know what is available, and I do not reject anything, uh, you know, just like that. I have to think about it why I'm rejecting uh, something, but uh, on the other hand, I do want to use as much as possible uh, local materials. But I know that is what's available to the poor, and it just actually you know it just happened that those uh, there's a kind of synergy between uh, you know what we find locally what is affordable what is uh, uh, really quite inexpensive and it's also uh, like environmentally you know suitable and friendly and and, and uh, appropriate so you have to find the right way of doing it because i know that if i had if i used on the roof just my 
matting. And I, I do have this uh, pozzolona finish on the top, but still there are chances of, of uh, eroding, of erosion of the, of the soil, and then the water might leak. So if you just put a layer which is buried in there, and then you know the, the, the roof is good for years and years. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, the toilet is for dignity of women. Yeah. Because otherwise they are go going into fields. And I have to tell you, I, think I had no understanding of this when I went in 2005 to the earthquake area. There were days, uh, I mean, I would go for the day and there were no toilets and I couldn't understand how, how women handled it. And I asked them and they said, well, early morning before Fajr prayers, that's early morning before the sun rises actually. And then later, and then late at night after the sun sets behind the bushes and in that cold weather with snow everywhere you have no idea i mean i i just could not understand and so that's why i wanted now for every woman to have a toilet i mean yeah. that's my big desire yeah. now that someone can spread toilets and my toilets are very inexpensive because we make them again with bamboo and, and earth and they are eco toilets we're teaching everybody how to actually make compost out of solid waste and so this is again you know no waste uh, strategy so there's much that can be done and poor people are really ready to learn and you know they are if we can just get to them that's all that we need to do yeah. um so, you know i mean your bamboo work the the bamboo work at the makli uh, cultural center the uh, community center is just fabulous right it's beautiful the, the first time you see that you're like wow this is just such a beautiful um uh frame and i was uh fascinated by how you spoke about that the use of knowledge in the design of that frame because i think one of the modernist imaginations of design is you know you have the architect the architect makes the design and then it goes to site and then somebody builds it and of course what you're talking about is how do you decentralize that process um and so that's my question to you which is that what does it look like to work in a decentralized knowledge uh design to, to use a decentralized knowledge, uh, model of knowledge and design, you know, of where we kind of source knowledge about how to make something and design together. What does it look like when design actually becomes democratic? Um, and so to follow up on that question, I'm also interested in what um, the architecture office looks like in a barefoot architecture model, you know, in a barefoot economy, what, what changes in how the architecture office uh, looks, uh, how, how the architecture office performs. Um, and to, to kind of complete that question, how is it different from working with contractors? You know, we, we, we all sort of know that experience of working with contractors. What is it like working in this other mode? Yeah, it's a very tough in the beginning, you know, I have to tell you that when I first went to the earthquake area and, you know, uh, we just had drawings in our hands and uh, didn't know what to do and how to get people going because it had to be done by people themselves. And I'm not, I'm not very good at actually giving instructions as to how do you do the layout even because I've never done it in my life before. But uh, I learned quickly and, uh, uh, and we managed to then work with people and say, look, you know, this is the size and let's draw this and then we would all look at it and a lot of it was changed also you didn't you know there was nothing that you you sort of said if it got to be done in this particular way because you knew you know you have to accept maybe a little bit skew maybe not quite you know level and so on and so you quickly learned that you know they are these are not defects they are as long as the building is stable that's perfectly okay so you know you accept that but also i found that people themselves are very interested in how the output was they were really proud of it once they started to work on it themselves and that is what struck me because you know i was also like all architects that if i've done a design it's got to be done perfectly in that way and of course there's no such thing there so a lot of it is just sketches a lot of it is just sitting down there with them and then laying them out and uh, and just um, uh, you know it's like like music like eastern music like our music where you just keep on innovating you know you just innovate as you go along and uh, and you can never fail because everybody's there and they want to make their own thing and that's fine you know so everything is different each one will be different from the other and that's good because you don't want a mass produced system and even though my bamboo panels as you saw are really prefabricated but each one of the ones that when they build them they're different yeah so you never know that is the same thing and that's the beauty of of uh, co co-creation i think uh, and and democratize, democratization because that's where everybody's you know interest comes in, and they can finish them as they wish. I mean I, I don't say you must put something there, 
as long as uh, the, for me the most important uh, aspect is that it, everything must be stable and that when the earthquake happens they should not collapse and when floods happen they should stay so that be ensured and and they know and everybody knows that for their own safety they have to do these things so it's it's a uh, yeah it's it's fun it's very interesting and uh, yeah you 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 as i said you keep on innovating as you go along you you know keep on improvising yeah, I, and just to sort of mention it again, I I do think that sometimes the space of the architecture office can become a real space of exploitation, right? We have interns, we kind of have new graduates and we kind of load a lot of work on them. And I imagine that in your model, um, there must have some been some change in that as well, how the architecture office itself functions. So I was wondering about your office because I'm you must be working between Karachi and Makli, right? So there's some sort of, movement to and fro, there's yeah. people working on either end, there's a logistics to this process that can sometimes be invisible. Yeah, well, basically, of course, we, we act as you do normally as an architect, I do a sketch and then somebody draws it up and then, you know, it's taken there and then uh, we tell them and then, you know, it starts off and sometimes there are no drawings even because uh, people have remembered what is to be done. You have this barefoot entrepreneurs that we train then they're the ones who train everybody else as to how they should do it, and they get paid for that. That's how our Champa, who's our icon for uh, the stoves, uh, she uh, she made so much money. I mean, you know, ten thousand dollars a year uh, is, is, is a pretty good amount in this country, a huge amount actually. Yeah. So, uh, so they're the ones that we are training. These are, these are my intermediaries, mm -hmm. who can then go and and work with others. Because if you're doing something on large scale, obviously we can't be there. But now with my videos that we are making. Uh, I'm hoping that everybody can have them on their cell phone and they can just build them. Yeah. And that's that's really would be would be so we are trying to put down everything possible in that. So because it's all digital, so we can we are putting in uh, within that animations and sketches and all kinds of things so that people can just watch and, and do it. Yeah, I hope. So one of my um, one of my last questions that I have is that you know when you talk about our the response, the, the effect of climate change in terms of the disasters that uh, Pakistan has seen and the way in which your practice responded in terms of disaster relief. I was really interested by how you've not only set up a design practice, but a huge logistics effort, right? All of these designs have to also reach the places where they can make where they can make this uh, where, where they can be then implemented. And so I was really interested to understand that network that you've created. I'm sure that that also took very long and was a very uh, has now become a complex sort of machinery of its own. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that um, supply chain, you know, that you have produced through your work. Yeah, it's a, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that I had retired by that time. So I had no office when I went up to 2000, you know, in 2005, I went up uh, to the earthquake area. I had uh, no staff, literally. There were just a couple of people who were working on heritage. I think I was in Lahore as uh, UNESCO's national advisor at the time. So I was sitting in the Lahore fort and then this in, you know, immense tragedy happens to, happened to the country. And like everybody else, I thought I'd just have to go there. I didn't know what I could do. I knew doctors could be helpful, but I had no idea what an architect could do. And I'd never done any humanitarian work before in my whole life. I'd seen my parents involved in some way, but you know, nothing major. And so I asked my husband, I discussed with him and he said, you know, you're crazy. What will you do? How will you go? And anyhow, so then he said, okay, 500,000 is all that, you know, all right, I spare 500,000 that you take it. Uh, so I took that money and I went and I had no transport. I had no workforce. I had no idea. I had no materials, nothing. And I arrived in this dead of night and in, this, you know, mountainous terrain, terrain, which I'd never worked in before. But you know, what is amazing with humanitarian work that help comes very swiftly to you. I had no idea. And so I got so many volunteers from all over the world because somebody just published somewhere. And, uh, you know, I mean, just amazing. Um, um, some, some people came from Sharjah, from the American school. Some came from, uh, um, uh, from Scotland, from the Macintosh school. I mean, kids and their, their teachers and from all over the world, literally, and architects and, and from Pakistan itself. So they became my arm because I'd done a sketch and we'd done the drawings and we'd done some posters and we thought of a mobile kind of activity that we should go around everywhere telling people. And these kids and young people went up climbing mountains and 120 villages, you know, we just did it. Yeah. And we were all there and we're just working away and uh, it was just incredible. 
And so that is the feeling that's remained because it is humanitarian work. It is you're there for the service you know, of, of the people. So you, 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 know, you just have to work in that way. So we, I, don't, I have a very small, my organization is very, very small. Uh, we work through uh, all these people that we train and they go around and train others and, and carry on. And uh, uh, we, get, we get luckily quite a lot of support. So, uh, you know, as, as we get the support, whatever we have to do, I design something, I want to do different things every time. So we keep on, you know, uh, somehow, um, you know, whatever can be stretched, we keep on stretching. Like, you know, we never knew how to make domes and now we can do bamboo domes uh, and, and, and all kinds of bamboo things that I never thought we could do. So, and uh, the, the center is there and there are lots of people working there who are, we've trained and uh, uh, there are lots, lots of beggar communities that are now working. So oh, it's just spreading by itself, literally, you know, it really is. I, I know this, the office, this all, everything is very small. We work on a very, I mean, I've never had a very large office. I don't want uh, too many people, but the ones who are there are dedicated and we all work hard and it gets done. Um, it's guess- fun also. Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds like it's a very inspirational space. Um, and I guess, you know, you've spoken a little bit about how uh, how what challenges we're now coming up against, given this COVID-19 situation um, and this pandemic. My question is, how um, how do we therefore by the time the pandemic hits, it's already too late. In a way, the work you have done has laid a foundation for a kind of response. And the pandemic is such a different kind of disaster because it's um, so widespread, you know, it's not something that you can kind of go somewhere and um, respond immediately. And so in that sense, you know, to kind of round out all of these questions, perhaps you could say a little bit about um, the way in which this pandemic is challenging us. Obviously, you know, you cannot suddenly magically provide a solution. That's not what I'm asking, but how, this, how we are sort of thinking about the work we have done and where it's turning in the face of this, these new challenges? Well, of course, it's a very pertinent question, but I think all of us, I mean, all around the world now, everybody is affected by this pandemic. And uh, I think there are perhaps two um, se- separate categories, if you like, or separate uh, issues that we have to deal with. One is uh, the urban situation, which requires a great rethink now because whatever has been, has been done, I don't think it's working. Um, I mean, we know what's happened. So I think, you know, that's an, a field that people have to now start looking at uh, to see how to, as, as I said, you know, how, how you make a, create a humanistic environment where people are able to uh, do things um, uh, in the sense that, you know, you, I mean, families can't be cooped up in, in multi-story yeah. housing. Uh, you have to have open spaces. and really, why do we need so many vehicular streets? So we have to really, you know, we know that you can do without them as well. So, and so on and so on. But uh, my, more of my concern obviously is the rural areas. And I think the pandemic tells us that uh, we need to create better hygienic conditions for those people, which means better shelter, that means better sanitation. Uh, I mean, they must have, uh, you know, water and, and just the basic necessities. And that is possible with very little amount of money if uh, they follow, if anybody, if any government does follow what I'm, I'm saying, because people with co-building, the costs are really minimum. You know, I mean, because there are no contractors and people put their own labor into it and they find all, and the materials we use are locally available. Like thatch, you can just go and cut the grass and make your thatch roof. So if you know how to make it well, that's all that's needed. And if you want to make a mud wall, well, the, the earth is around you. They only need to be told how you can do it better. And that's what my I'm hoping my uh, tutorials, my videos will tell them so that they're able to just do it right. So that means disaster preparedness, yeah. which is something that must be, we must all be thinking about. Because, you know, at the time disaster happens, you go around saying, okay, let's do emergency things. And it never really works out. The next disaster, we are back to square one. So disaster preparedness is key to everything. And the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 obviously shows that we need to have, uh, I mean, in rural areas, uh, social distancing is possible, but they have no places to live in. So we need to provide that so that they are able to live comfortably. And that means that there'll be less, you know, the infection rate will be less and so on and so on. So there's plenty that can be done with very, and I really am, I believe, I'm a believer in really very small amounts of money. 
I don't believe in, I, I got the chance of putting up so many thousands because internationally there was a donor fatigue and this particular organization called IOM wanted to have, deliver these, these results and they did not have enough funds. So then they thought of me and they said, well, you know, she's you know, you asked me how he's doing something with Lyme and so on. That's how I got the chance. So I'm a great believer in really no money. And I would like my, everything that I do should be just, you know, zero cost. I mean, that's, that's what I would like to do. And then it can get to everybody. So, so that's what we have to do now. I mean, I think that's a wonderful note to kind of round out our conversation. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I really enjoyed that. So wonderful. Thank you, indeed. Bye, Yasmin. Bye.